Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jean Gallagher, financial advisor, founder of Seaside Solutions, and founder of Discover Rising Tides. And welcome to show number 33, Discover Rising Tides, How the Outside Makes the Inside Better, where we explore the importance of the outdoors in maintaining life balance. Through this series, we'll be taking, talking to women business owners to understand their journey. And we'll also be hearing from Lynn Schusler williams and, who is an author and a coach on her se segment of Rising Up. So first, I'd like to introduce Rebecca Hoffman. Hi, Rebecca, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm so glad you're here. This is exciting. Let me read a little bit of your bio and then we'll dive right in. So Rebecca is the founder of Good Egg Concepts, an independent boutique strategic communications consultancy drawing on 30 years of professional expertise earned while working in, for art museums, universities, and companies, Rebecca leads creative projects of every stripe. In partnership with her wide network of independent design and production colleagues, Rebecca develops brands in fine tunes, muddy existing brand identities, ghost writes, sparkling copy, strategizes with clients on a myriad of co uh, creative projects and brings a wildly fresh perspective to everyday business problems in the branding, communications, and marketing spheres. So you do a couple of things and let's, let's dive in. So thank you. Thank you again so much for being, being with me. And I love how we met and networking at its finest and and different people have led us together here. So I wanna thank everybody for connecting us. And so um, I wanna talk about your current business, but also how you how you got to where you are. Where did the journey start? Oh, well, thank you so much. And yes, I wanna also echo what you said. I think we're spanning the country here, which is so yes. fun and um, <laughs> through mutual acquaintances, which is a real treat. Uh, how did I get started? You know what, It's uh, I feel like my life has been a braid of uh, activities and adventures. And I was um, always interested in the marketing side of things and the communication side of things and typefaces and typography and words. And I think every single job that I've had has kind of built on the previous one, uh, not just with responsibility, but awareness and expertise. And so I think I'm 14 years into consulting solopreneur like uh, many people, uh, but I really, you know, my career began working with major universities and art museums, uh, learning kind of all the communications ropes. And as a side note, I grew up in Chicago and for some reason, and I don't know if this is true, but I have the sense that this is like the jingle um, kind of epicenter of America. And we had a lot of like really local commercials that were not very well produced, but they had amazing jingles and taglines and slogans and things. And I think I just grew up watching them when I was little and it always just stuck with me and always been part of that now. I've talked to so many people and a lot of common theme, theme from prior to being a solopreneur or a business owner or, or whatever the structure is today is that transition from corporate to being on your own. And everybody's mm -hmm transition is different mm -hmm. and what is your how how is that for you and and coming from a very different background right from right. the university or something very and art museums etc how was that transition for you and what made you take the jump you know i think the transition is really kind of interesting in the sense that and i don't know if everybody experiences this but my experience was with each successive job that i had I knew more and more and more. And I can remember very specific instances where someone I worked for taught me something about design or taught me something about marketing or communications in a very firm um, and clear way that suited the organization we were working. And I found at some point I was just an expert and people were asking me from the sidelines, could you help with this project? Could you help with that project? And I started to just have projects and I didn't realize that that's consulting. Uh, that's really how it began. And then um, around 2008, 2009, I had an opportunity to really kind of go full tilt on my own and I did. And interestingly, someone I knew who had an interesting um, office in a, in a house behind their house in Chicago said, come work in my space. And they had a bunch of different workspaces and I would sort of go to work there every day. And before I knew it, I had several projects and one that was a two year contract with a very large organization to ghost write a book for them. And it just started. Uh, and I think what happened was, and this must happen to other people, once you know kind of a lot of stuff about your industry, mm -hmm. you, can, you can go and do these things. And I, I think I just realized that at some point that I could just 
have my own consulting practice, but I kind of dundered into it in a way. That's almost fortunate <laughs> that you did, right? I love that word dunder too, because well, it is it is so fortunate because so many people will plan, oh my gosh, I'm gonna leave this structure here and I'm gonna transition to this structure here. And how do I manage myself between one and the other? And it just flowed for you. Yeah, it did. And as a creative person, um, I didn't sit down and write a big business plan to begin this and launch mm -hmm. this. It evolved as things mm -hmm. do. And I think it's still evolving. I really feel like every year the business and the practice shifts and turns and changes. And it it's still the same business, but it, it does take on different kind of tonal qualities year by year. And the creative side of you helps it continue to evolve. So it's yeah. not the same as it might have been or or even as you might have imagined after right. you started to dunder in 2008. <laughs> well, it is. It's a, there's a dynamism, right? Like it, I, it's never the same. And people ask me, what's your day like? I'm like every day is different. Every day is full of different adventures and experiences and conversations and projects. And it's just how it is. Uh, and it's always been that way. But I think as a creative person, I look forward to that. I think mm -hmm. for other people, that would be terrifying and right. unpleasant. But I think that's why so much of this is about fit. Yeah, aside from expertise, like, does it suit you, right? And it, this suits me. So. That's fantastic. And so the, uh, my phone rings at an inopportune time. There. So always happens, right? For sure. <laughs> That's what the do not disturb that you're supposed to click on is for. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so tell me about the ghost writing process, because for me, I don't know that I would consider myself a creative, but in my own industry, I am creative, mm -hmm. but the writing process is always intrigued me, but I don't have, it's very difficult for me to put words on paper mm -hmm. in any structure, but, but when you're, when you're ghostwriting for somebody else, that's mm -hmm. different, isn't it? Than your own thoughts and, and oh, yeah. processes. Oh, so yeah. what is it like to do that? Well, I think it's very interesting and I've done it for so long. I don't even think about it anymore, but I think the really, the, the essential aspect is uh, I must assume the perspective of who I'm writing for. So whatever the instant, whether it's a letter or a book or an annual report or a speech or chapters for somebody or their social media content, uh, I have to imagine how that person sees the world or what their perspective and point of view is. And then I have to assume that as the writer. And so I tend to do a little research um, when I'm getting to know a client or a project to understand better the kind of the environment they're working in and also kind of the, the tonal qualities that they need in their writing. And that's what I go after depending on what, what the project is. But it, I, I do so much writing for people and I tell people, you know, if I write something, don't say, oh, our consultant wrote it. Just say, I wrote it. That's why you hire consultants. And I said, take all the claim. That That's what you get. And say, look what I wrote. And people do. So it happens all the time. I write all kinds of things for people. Their blog content, their, uh, you name it. <laughs> I've probably that, and that it. must also create change, right? So you're thinking in different mm -hmm. manners as different people sure. throughout each project that you have. So it brings up it brings different dynamics to each project too, right? Oh, absolutely. And I think people are often surprised because many people will come to me and say, I just don't know how to write this, that, or the other thing. I've had people come to me with halfway written, but live websites that are missing text and pages. I've had people come to me to say, I've got to write this, this chapter for a book and I have no idea how to do it. It really confounds people. I think a lot of people are very uncomfortable with the act of writing. And so we'll talk about whatever it is that needs to be accomplished. And I always tell people, just like everything else, it's iterative. So if we write something, you can modify it before it's mm. published. Uh, and so we do a lot of back and forth and I'll take a, a chance and I'll write what I think I've heard or what I understand. And more times than not, people can then just react to it with their own emotional or facts that they need to make sure are in there. And we'll, we'll get the draft done very quickly. So I do think, you know, Every project is different. It has a different texture to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but even the driest business writing can be fun to put together as a ghostwriter. That's it. That's, that's incredible. And, mm -hmm. and, and so how does, how did your business evolve? So from 2008 till now, what were the, the processes or what were the stages of, of yeah. business? Well, it began with one project as things often do. Mm -hmm. um, 
an organization I was introduced to needed someone to help them write and do the art direction for a book they were chartered with publishing for another client and it was out of their wheelhouse and so they said could you help us I said definitely uh, so um, this particular project had specific characteristics that needed to be um, addressed and included and I just got to work and we did and they did the technical editing and I did what I would call the readability editing and writing and uh, it came together beautifully that was a first and then I think what happened uh, as things often do is um, someone would introduce me to someone and say oh do you know she just did this project or that and the next thing I know somebody's like I need somebody to help me with that and then the next thing would happen and the next and um, through referral and word of mouth um, I've just had dozens and dozens and dozens of clients they tend to fall into a few categories not exclusively but it kind of makes sense uh, one of the areas I love to work for is what I call organizations that look like they don't need marketing. And so that's a lot of professional services and organizations that historically maybe even ethically were bound to not market themselves like law practices, medical practices, mm. just wasn't done. Um, and it's all flipped inside out now. And most people didn't go to grad school to do this sort of creative work. So they need a person like me who can quickly become a subject matter expert in their area and help them communicate what they need to communicate, whether it's writing or website or social media strategy or advertising, it all kind of ties together. And so really one project leads to the next to the next and invariably somebody will be with their professional peers and say, who does your marketing? And they'll say my name. And the next thing I know, I'm getting a call from somebody saying, I heard you do blah, blah, blah. And then I end up being considered for that or getting the opportunity to work on those things. Word so, of mouth is amazing. Yeah, I would say that, you know, the whole practice has just kind of bloomed and it happened pretty quickly in the first year or two and it just hasn't really stopped. So I work for the like thing, you know, organizations that look like they don't have marketing. And then interestingly, I started to get a lot of referrals for uh, organizations like houses of worship that, again, don't look like they need marketing and they do. Um, at least now it's a very competitive marketplace for pretty much every business. And a lot of organizations didn't think of themselves as business. And so um, adding that kind of backbone in their communications makes a huge difference in their success or failure. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Things have changed so much so that yeah. there, that does actually create a category. Right. Businesses that didn't need it, but really right. do or didn't right. know they, what, know they right. needed it until they found out they should have had. Right. And, right. and they're marketing really wasn't in their business structure. Correct. How things have changed. Not only was there no budget, there was no awareness. Um, right. And I came through the nonprofits like universities. Uh, and one of the things I learned in working for many nonprofits and now having a lot of nonprofit clients is a lot of organizations still don't realize that just because you're a chartered nonprofit doesn't mean you can't make money and mm. shouldn't make money. But you have to learn how to reinvest that money into your mission and your um, and your services that you provide. And so, uh, you know, having a strong marketing program in place for even the, mo the most humble organization is an enormous uh, benefit to help an organization survive and make sure that, you know, stakeholders are hearing the messages, whatever mm. they are, for whatever the organization. So what are some of the trigger points for businesses that, that do fit in that category that really, really signifies you might, sh maybe you should consider having some sort of marketing? Well, probably um, one of the things that people come to me and say frequently, and I don't think people necessarily even realize what they're saying is they'll say, we don't seem to be getting as many referrals as we used to, and they don't mm -hmm. know why. Or they'll say, um, you know, it's, it seems like we have competition now and the public is confused. Um, and in any industry, you know, if you have 10 or 20 service providers in the same channel, the person standing on the street can't tell the difference, whether it's lawyers or realtors or financial planners, they can't tell. Um, to them, to the uneducated or uninformed consumer, it all looks the same. So mm -hmm. how do you differentiate? And I think the, the, the cornerstone of all the work that I do is, uh, helping an organization or a business differentiate itself from its competition, in particular when it's not clear what the difference is. It's more apparent um, in a situation like restaurants. You may have a donut shop next to a seafood restaurant. It's very clear that mm -hmm. they're different. Um, it's a lot harder in the services and in the professional um, industries 
because the consumer can't tell. Mm. So that's yeah. where we often begin. I like I like the term that you use. the The public is confused, mm -hmm. and I and I think that that really that really creates a picture. And honestly, I never thought about that for me as you know as a financial advisor. I never thought about the public being confused. But I can see, and even in the financial world, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. how that can that would need clarity so that people understand or might recognize this is a service that I needed or this is the nonprofit that I'm looking for. Oh, oh, that's really what they do. I had mm -hmm. no idea. Yeah, I draw a lot of my technique with respect to creative um, services and approaches from the user experience space and also psychotherapy just because I think it's very interesting. And um, both, interestingly, the user experience space and psychotherapists always work with their client or their customer or their patient um, to understand what is it like to receive what's being emanated out. So mm -hmm. if you're a business and it's unclear what your mission is or what you're offering, or it's become unclear because you have a lot more competition than you did five years ago or 10 years ago, what is that like for the consumer to receive that information. Um, and it can take the form of, uh, you know, I'll talk with clients about, are you giving people like Excel spreadsheets and Word docs when you meet with them? <laughs> and a lot of people say, oh yes, we do. And what's that like to receive that? That's stressful for people. They don't mm -hmm. know what to make of it. That's a pile of papers that sits on the desk. Uh, so how do we design that for readability? How do we write that so it's engaging? How do, we, what, is, what is a person's experience of what your business is giving? And I, I think we see a lot of instances in the world where uh, companies or organizations are really succeeding and people really relate to them. And then we see examples where people um, can't relate to them and they're not succeeding mm, with their customers. Yeah. yeah. So that's like where I creatively come from. I always ask people, what's that like? And let's explore that first before we do anything. What is it like to receive what you have? And people, you know, you can tell when you said, how do people know to come to you? Like, you know, when someone gives you a business card and they say, oh, this is, I'm new, this is my predecessor's business card. And they scratch out their name and write their name. You know what? You need business cards. And by the way, do they look great? You know, are you proud of them? Does it feel like a gift that you have to give? Or is it a burden when you hand it to someone that they now have to contend with? Yeah. So that's and I where like, we begin. And that's interesting <laughs> when you say, how is it received? And it almost... What, when you were saying that, what made me think about is what you had said in the beginning about being in Chicago in the land of jingles, in, right? And so jingles are received and yeah. they're received and repeated. And it right. was very simple back then. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a quick little jingle that, mm -hmm. that really gave a picture yep. of what happened. And so yep. things are so much more complicated now, but you're taking that, that learned experience and turning it into more modern day needs. And I'm sure that many companies and many, many businesses don't think, I wonder what people think when I hand them this paper. Right. What an, what an intuitive thought process and how important. Yeah, some companies do and some don't. And I think we can learn from what I call the Jedi masters of marketing. Uh, and even the smallest business can borrow from that. And, you know, as an example, and this is, I, um, I don't profit from this to even say this, but like if we look at Apple, you know, they've turned tech support into a visit to a museum. You go to the mm -hmm. Apple store, it's tech support. More times than not, you go there because you have a problem. Mm -hmm. And you go in there and you might even wait. And it's okay for yeah. most people. And you usually come out pleased that it was solved or whatever had to happen is being handled. Uh, it's kind of genius. They borrowed from museums to take an unpleasant experience and make it pleasant. Mm -hmm. And if you buy a new product, when you the unboxing, it's a sensory experience. It feels good in your hands. It's visually mm -hmm. appealing. It's it, there are totems that you know people save the packaging because it looks nice and it feels good. It's interesting and it feels special. Uh, there's no reason why small businesses can't borrow from that, and you know even the smallest business can borrow from that and figure out ways to map those um, emotional experiences people have with like a large uh, company and mm -hmm. use it for their own success. So I think the, we can learn a lot from places that are very clearly doing these things mm. um, and, and have a, a lot of success at the small business level. Because honestly, isn't it, it is relationship building, mm -hmm. in it, but it's relationship building between the consumer and the thing that passes to them. 
Right. Is, so it's it's prior yeah. to the person to person relationship building. Can that can the person receiving the content feel something about it? Right. And, and you want attach, the emotions. attach a feeling to it. You want yeah, you want that emotional connection to be delight, right? Anything mm -hmm. less than delight, you're not winning. And so even if you're handing people a folder full of papers, they have to sign or read or understand. They should be beautifully designed and printed on gorgeous paper. So when they do, it's very satisfying and maybe offer some educational component so people feel like they become experts in learning whatever it is you're sharing with them. Um, we, I mean, we can just see lots and lots of examples of this in the very big corporate space and then at the local business level, even jingles, you know, they were meant to just have people remember a telephone number mm -hmm. or a brand uh, for a carpet company for, um, you know, I was talking with my husband recently about like, does anyone even rust proof their car anymore? I don't think so, but that used to be like a thing. And we had companies that did that and their jingles were very interesting. Um, you can remember that it gets burned into your brain. So I, we well, can... I can remember the jingle that it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a selling product. It was actually a TV show from Boston, Massachusetts back in the seventies. And it included their address. And mm -hmm. I can say, I can still say it because it it's, stuck with you. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I bet if you Googled it, you'd find there's a lot of people who have a nostalgia for it. Yes. And so I think that's the emotional quality is people want to remember it then it's part of their lived experience. And so if you create very positive emotional connections with your customers or your stakeholders or the people mm -hmm. with whom you're trying to create advocacy or anything like that, you have a chance at um, not just persuading them, but gaining them as your advocate or your evangelist, mm -hmm. which is what you need to be successful across the years. And how different that is for the nonprofit space. Right. Nonprofits didn't have to think a lot about this until relatively recently. I mean, they kind of were lucky that people were charitable and people knew how to support these local organizations or national organizations, but everything's kind of heated up. And the expectation now is that everyone's functioning at the highest corporate levels, even the smallest business. So um, I think the nonprofits have to be careful that they, you know, uh, put into place smart marketing schemes, but also um, lots of kind of touch points that make sure people remember them uh, along mm -hmm. the way, because it is a much noisier atmosphere than it was, you know, pre-internet. So is it really the competition or the internet or the ability to Google something quickly that, that has changed the space for them or what has changed? Yeah, I think everything. I mean, I think everyone's really stirred up and everybody, you know, picks up their phone. I'm going to do research, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, how many times a day does somebody pick up their phone to search for something and the oh. questions that we ask, right? And so, yeah, I think it's a totally uh, different landscape than it was before all of this. And before all of this, you just knew what organizations were or you didn't know them at all. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think you, you kind of touch upon lots of organizations and then it's up to the organization to make sure they fight their way into your memory that you stay long enough to support them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the challenge for the nonprofits is there's so much more competition. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And, and, so, and so now, how, does your, how is your business structured now? Yeah, I've always structured it in a, a similar way. It's an unagency. I have all the agency services at my fingertips, but I don't charge agency fees or have markups or commissions and so forth that um, would burden my customers. I get paid for my expertise. And then if any vendors that I introduce them to are selected to do work, they get paid directly. So my model is like a deconstructed agency, mm. uh, which tends to be pretty affordable for a, um, you know, a lot of businesses versus going um, and paying a lot of fees for things and you don't get that much for your money. And, and I think- Or they're know, not, though, or the person is not responsible for general contracting the work. You know, they find you right. and then they know they have to find somebody else to do some other things. You're actually doing the right. general contracting for the, the agency work exactly. for them. And I do a tremendous amount of what I would just call matchmaking. I, I don't even get compensated for it, but I think it's important to connect people who should know each other for any number of reasons, whether it's a creative person with a business person or two business people because they're working in a similar strategic space and should know each other. And I think the synergies are amazing um, and they're really good for everybody's business. And so uh, that's, that's a big piece of what I do is really kind of like interest in an interesting way, sort of connecting dots that are not necessarily obvious on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's something I like to do. I think that's a lost art, right? <laughs> yeah. So I think yeah. that now I think that you, I think that that, that 
attitude or the the um, thoughtfulness to say, hey, let me learn something about you so that I might know somebody that you should be talking to because we're all in such an immediate gratification. Here's my stuff, buy it, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of networking that happens, it's it's networking. We were taught, we talked about this quickly before we got on. It's networking that happens in a situation where here, here is who I am. Here's what I have. Do you want to buy this? Okay. Right. Now I'm going to go to the next person. And, right. um, some of the networking groups though, that Lynn handles that we were talking mm -hmm. about, it really yeah. becomes more of a relationship. If I learn about you, Mm -hmm. I'm going to know somebody that can, right. that might benefit from your services or that you should probably talk to. And right. I, you know, as the internet has grown and in our phones and things, I think we've lost that ability to communicate with others and, or the want or the care to do right. that. And I think uh, the piece that's been challenging in the last few years is um, I think humans need to know each other in mm -hmm. whether we're on zoom doing this or sitting together having a cup of coffee and talking about our business practices or presenting in a large group. I think that there is no substitute for human involvement and connection, especially as it pertains to business development. And so we have great tools now. I mean, we just have tools beyond tools, almost too many. And that's been the big shift over the years too, is now, you know, if you're doing marketing, you need to employ a lot of different tactics and tools compared to 10, 15 years ago. But there's still a place, I always say this to my clients, for all the digital stuff we're doing, there's still a place for the analog. Like we may digitize everything and email everything and we may go paperless, but maybe we should give a little paper sometimes and maybe it should be really amazing paper that somebody wants to receive and hold in their hands and have or something else that's not necessarily that. But the idea being um, this human connection really, it, it hasn't evaporated, but we, I think it's very easy to think that it has. And, and possibly if there's something good that's come out of COVID, right, is mm -hmm. our ability to assimilate to a more digital, yeah. personal, if you can put digital and personal yeah. in the same sentence, yes. interaction, right, yes. and, and more comfortable having these types of, we right. never would have meant prior to COVID. No, and, right. and, and how uh, would we, right? You know, I would have to get on a plane and fly to you or you to me. Mm -hmm and take that chance. Um, think of all the meetings we used to have to wait to set, mm -hmm. to see someone in person. Now, I see my clients from time to time, but not all the time. And it has accelerated the rate with which we can achieve whatever it is we're seeking to do, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. And then we need to pause occasionally and just sit with each other and get together somehow, whether it's a Zoom or in person, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we're still connecting. Because mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. is accelerated. Everything, communications is, is like a house on fire. So you have to be careful too, because everything is moving at this great rate of speed that we have to use caution. And, and so how did your, where your business had been established fairly well mm -hmm. prior to COVID? Yeah. And I've talked to a lot of people that uh -huh. had just started their business just before COVID. And so they were in a transition already and then COVID became another transition. How did it change? How did your already established business evolve or unexpectedly through COVID times? Yeah, you know, it's interesting when when the pandemic first sort of became defined as such in one of 2020, February, March time, I really thought to myself, well, I'm going to get a nice long break because everyone <laughs> murders the marketing schemes when things are in trouble. And so mm -hmm. I just assumed that and I started to assume like things are going to slow down. I'll do some other thing. I'll do some writing. I'll do some other creative things. And I would say for about 10 days, it got real quiet, like birds in the trees before a storm. It got silent. <laughs> I think everyone was panicked which is mm -hmm. understandable mm -hmm. and nothing much happened. And then all of a sudden I got a call and another call and another call. And the next thing I knew, everybody was saying, our website's not up to speed. We don't have SEO in place. We don't have our um, advertising, digital advertising and on and on and on. And all of a sudden I, I, I never worked more in my life than during the pandemic. It was just nonstop. And then I didn't have to go anywhere. So I had even more meetings. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. I would say business probably doubled or tripled during the pandemic and it never really let up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think what happened was all the organizations I worked for, they put off the important work they had to do on building strong websites and uh, strong digital backbones, which suddenly were essential. And mm -hmm. So I think the first year of the pandemic was just spent doing that. And now it's all about um, really harnessing and understanding and making the most of the digital presence, which 
nobody did before that. All the professional services were like, we have meetings. We don't talk on the phone. We need to schedule time in the office and that's over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I would say, you know, it all just kind of cartwheeled and tripled and doubled and tripled in ways that it's never going to go back the other way. Could you have imagined? No. In fact, the other day I was trying to remember, what did I do before the pandemic as far as group phone calls? And I was like, right, I had a 800 number. We would all call I'll dial in into and, the yes. Congress number. And exactly. everyone would say, this is Rebecca. You know, uh, what I want to say is blah, and we would take turns talking. And I remember thinking, huh, that seems ancient, you yeah. know? I haven't I used conference that conference call line. Too. I, know, yeah. right? <laughs> I haven't used it in three plus years. I'll probably never right. use it again. Never, no. Never. It's it's amazing. It is amazing how we've all adjusted and re redefined our space. Yeah, you know, I think we all, I mean, the good news about humans is we're flexible. And so at first it was really hard and we all complained, I can't believe this is happening and blah, 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 blah. And now we're like, all right, well, this is how it's gonna be. So we meet quarterly, great, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rest of the time I'm working from home, okay. okay. Sounds good, yeah. Just send me what we, I need to look at and I'll do it. And I think we've all sort of like assimilated that into our experience. And now we just have to make sure that we don't lose our humanity in the process. But I think, I think we're figuring it out. I think I so. I think so. I think there was a point where we started to, and mm -hmm. I think right. people are realizing how important yep. that right. interaction really is. Right. And trying to balance that um, kind of in the office, out of the office experience, which I think a lot of people were still trying to figure out what does the built environment have that we still need versus the virtual. And we're, I think it's gonna bend and flex for a while. I don't think we really know. I think the greatest challenge is in cities, like what do you do with all these giant buildings that nobody needs all of a sudden, you know? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I live in a city that has gorgeous giant buildings and most of them are kind of empty and nobody cares. Well, I don't wanna be in there, you know, mm -hmm. don't need it. Certainly don't need to sit there all day waiting for somebody to come to me with a paper to sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. That's probably a big challenge is catching up to what we built that mm -hmm. suddenly we don't need by accident. Right. Yeah. And and so now what does the what does a typical client interaction look like for you from beginning to actually working with a client? Uh, well, that's interesting. I think number one, I meet people where they are literally and figuratively. If people want to meet in person, we do it. If we can't because of distance or other matters, we get together like this or on a phone or by email. And I meet people where they are intellectually too, because I think like anything, whether you're starting a dietary or an athletic program or mm -hmm. trying to achieve any goal, uh, everyone comes from a different starting point. And some people mm -hmm. want to go fast and do everything. And some people want to do just one thing. And I think that's just fine. And so often it's about defining, okay, what are the issues that we're facing? How might we tie them down, look at some different approaches and then decide by prioritization, what feels right? Like, what feels like the right beginning place to begin and momentum comes along pretty fast with projects that are creative uh, and tends to be a little bit like home renovation if you bought a big interesting house that needed a lot of work but you weren't really ready to gut it some people are they just they're going to do it some people just want to paint a bathroom but you know you start painting a bathroom now you look at the hallway and you go hmm mm -hmm. i could maybe do that and that light fixture is sort of funny you could fix that and you know you unch your way around and the, it's okay either way mm -hmm. So it's very personalized. Completely. And, it, and there's no template. I mean, I know lots of ways to do things. Like if you needed a certain type of brochure, I, I have dozens of samples that we could look at for inspiration, but there's not one way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so everything is personalized. Mm -hmm. So so you as a solo entrepreneur, a solopreneur, and mm -hmm. your business has doubled or tripled over the last yeah. couple of years. And and we are we as i too right we are technically a little bit more isolated because mm -hmm. we're you know mm -hmm. in in this land of yep. more digitalized communication mm -hmm. how do you how do you take care of yourself how do you manage yep. yourself so that you are in present yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think, you, you know, your podcast touches on a lot of these aspects of people's functioning. And I think it's so interesting as a creative years ago, probably more than 10 years ago, I had this worry as I was getting into my practice. And I've told this to other people, what happens if I stop being creative? I had this oh. thought of like, what would happen if I no longer had any good ideas or creative ways of thinking about problems? What would happen? Mm. And so 
to kind of allay my concerns, um, I just decided to take on personal things that were interesting to me. And at the time, my kids were young, so I was slightly limited. I couldn't go like traveling the world for six months at a time. But I could do things around my house that were interesting that related to like cultivating plants or cooking or um, creative uh, approaches to doing one thing or another. I got interested in orchids and playing with them and um, kind of seeing how do you make these things go? Like, what does it take? And uh, I've gotten really good at a few things that I did not know 10, 12 years ago. Mm. But I believe those activities kind of feed my intellect. Um, in addition to like reading very widely, making sure I sleep every night, which I think is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, and just looking after myself, because as they say, like in, a, in an airplane, like if you if you can't take care of someone else until you take care of yourself. So, you know, I I've pursued a lot of like very everyday creative activities, which I think nourish sort of broader creative experiences. And I do travel a lot now um, to places that are interesting. And when I go places, I always go check out the art museum. Like I was in uh, a small city in Iowa this past weekend and they just reopened their art museum after a terrible flood 15 years ago. And it's gorgeous. And mm. it was so worth a stop. And they have um, the most important Jackson Pollock work that he'd ever created. And it's in Iowa, who knew? And it's just hanging there contentedly on the wall, waiting for people to come and look at it and think about it. I find that thrilling. I think that puts a lot of wind in my creative sails. Uh, so I look for those moments. Um, I, I love the fact that you had the intuition to worry about your own professional creativity and to find that, you're, that it's fed with your personal creativity. How unique to put those two pieces together. Well, I think, um, you know, there's no end of creativity if you allow it to kind of flourish. It's like athleticism or intellectualism or anything like that. All of that will flourish if you nurture it. So I, I um, you know, I read a lot. I probably read more than most people I know just because I enjoy it and I read widely um, mm -hmm. and not thematically, just across all sorts of disciplines. And I watch documentary films, much to my family's chagrin. I'm always watching something. They're like, it's so arcane what you're watching. Uh, and I'm like, but I'm learning something. And it's, it always adds something to what I know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how, it's like the well doesn't go dry then. If you are creating things, making things, I like to cook, which sounds ridiculous as it relates to creativity, but it actually, it that is, hand It work, is very creative. Yeah, yeah. So I think all of that kind of nurtures the creativity. Um, oh, I like, uh, yeah, that's, that's a really a unique, I never thought about it, but it just makes total sense too. Yeah. I tell my clients, if you're not sure what to do, go fold laundry and you're going to know, you know, <laughs> go get a giant mountain of laundry and fold it and think about this and it's going to come to you. Keep a notebook handy. And I say notebook because it's different than digital. Write it down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a no, different experience. It is. Um, there, I, there's things that I have to have written that I, I'm fairly, I'm fairly cloud driven i could sure. i could pop into a computer any place and work but yeah. there are certain things that and now i have to carry my multiple notebooks with me because mm -hmm. i have things that i just physically have to write down yeah. Yeah. because it feels better absolutely and our, the way that information kind of floats around in our brain is different than if we typed it on the notepad on our tablet mm -hmm. and it, it i think it always will i just think the way we experience the flow of information is different Mm -hmm. um, and I need sketching. to read paper. I, yes. I need to read a book. I can't read uh, a um, screen. It's not as satisfying. I'm yes. on a screen all day. The yeah. having, holding, physically holding the paper. is fabulous. Feels paper wonderful. feels great. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a human experience. It's tactile. I kind of think, and my brain divides information into like temporal and non-temporal. So like I can read the newspaper on my phone or a tablet or my laptop, but I still get the Sunday New York Times because it's such a good read. If I look at it on a digital, I don't read all the articles. I just kind mm -hmm. of slide through it all. I miss everything. When mm -hmm. I read it and I see the ads and smell the paper and just take my time, it's kind of delightful. Mm, I can. I always say that. it's been a good Sunday if I've read the paper in its entirety. <laughs> Although there'll often be like a Thursday where I'm still reading the previous Sunday's, Sunday's paper. paper. <laughs> it's okay. It's features writing. But I think, you know, as a component to all of this, aside from like all of these like activity driven things that um, help creativity, 
to your real mission and point, you know, being outside is the giant reset, right? Mm -hmm. Having a long walk or getting near a large body of water or a place of like um, physical or geological importance mm -hmm. is the reset. It is. And, and the wa water, water is magic. Yep, totally. And I think um, we don't realize how badly we need to kind of meditate on these things without necessarily having a mantra and not necessarily mm -hmm. even having a formal practice. But um, that's absolutely true. And, you know, there's a place I live um, just off Lake, uh, Lake Michigan, and there's a place where I can go and work um, literally on the lake. I, I can, it's a parking lot that juts out into the lake. So if it's a windy, wavy day, my car might even get splashed, which is kind of fun. And I love to work there, especially in, when we have what we call bad weather, which we have mm -hmm. a lot of here in Chicago. We have a lot of bad weather. And uh, that's a giant reset. And so I think that that contributes also not just to creativity, but to sort of like an outward hopefulness about advancing whatever we're working on. And, and I think can, it's true for all people. Oh, I, I agree. And it can change. You can mm -hmm. feel so pointed in your thought process or even overwhelmed in the, the things mm -hmm. that you need to do. And by removing yourself or putting yourself in that outdoor mm -hmm. environment, not having a roof over your head if you pretend right. the car roof isn't there too, right? right. It doesn't feel like it yep. is. And right. it, it just expands your mm -hmm. ability to realize that what you're doing isn't as overwhelming as it felt when you were stuck inside. Yeah, I think so. And I think there's a general feeling of like sun or wind or air mm -hmm. that completely shifts how we experience work and projects uh, and what maybe we define as like our daily stresses. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I know some people go jogging, some people are mountain climbers, some people go kayaking. And all, I mean, all of these pursuits are amazing. Uh, but I do think that probably people who get outside um, are able to be more creative than people who are stuck inside all the time mm -hmm. for any number of reasons. One of the challenges that I have is because I'm in charge of my own calendar, mm -hmm. right? So that yeah. that's a positive and a challenge yeah. at the same time that I'll find myself it's three o'clock and I haven't I'm still sitting at doing things right. because I don't have a scheduled break unless I, sometimes I have to actually schedule it on my calendar to remind mm -hmm. myself that I'm supposed to be doing something other than this. Yeah, I think that's okay. Um, I also know that people will call it like open loops and closed loops too. Sometimes if you write things down, you no longer have to worry about remembering to do something. And so mm -hmm. if you do schedule that, uh, it's a lot easier to go, aha, now's the time when I go for a walk or how, this is the time when I go for a run or whatever it is that you want to pursue. So I think, I think there's a, a huge, I mean, a huge amount of understanding around that in terms of um, not just output, but creativity or kind of the exploratory posture you need to have to be mm -hmm. successful with whatever project you're working on. Yeah. And I love the fact that you say in good weather, good weather and bad weather, because it's so easy to use the bad weather as an excuse to be, right. to not do something. Right. Right. I'm guilty of that. But then I always remind myself, is it the, the Danes or the um, Scandinavians who say there, uh, there's no such thing as bad weather. There's just bad clothing, you know? <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, and we have, so, and I would say like where I live, we have so much weather, just so much of it. We have so much gear you can usually figure out a way to get outside one way or the other um, to varying degrees of satisfaction, but you can certainly experience the day. Yes. Yeah. And you, honestly, you got to plan for it and, mm -hmm. and know yeah. in your head that if I do this, I'm not going, it's not going to be so uncomfortable because I'm prepared and I have right. the right, the right, right things. Yep. Gear and also probably mindset, which I'm guilty of at times. I can get pretty like seasonal, whoa, that's mm -hmm. winter. But uh, I get outside and I make sure I see the sun if there is any or just light mm -hmm. in general um, mm -hmm. for I think the circadian impact that it has on us, which I think is really important. It is really important. Mm -hmm. Yes. And especially now that the time has changed and yeah. the date it's darker. Yep. Way too early. It, oh, makes, yeah. it's, it makes a huge difference to even make that attempt, even if even if it is darker to be active. But I do find from a work standpoint, this time of year is one of great productivity because I don't also feel the urge to like, just go outside for a walk. You know, it's a lot easier to kind of hunker down and focus um, mm -hmm. with the weather kind of swirling around us, which I think is also kind of an interesting way to experience this. It's, mm. you know, 
it has its benefits. Maybe we're like bears hibernating here. I think mm -hmm. that's probably what it's like. I think so too. Yeah, mm -hmm. it does. It, it mm -hmm. does. And as long as you're not, it's easy for me to pick up a book and curl up for mm -hmm. a week. Yep. <laughs> yep. So I have yeah. to be conscious of that. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, um, those are the great pleasures and it's a little harder to do when everyone's outside and going to the beach or a street festival or something. Yeah. It's, it's, that's more disrupted. So that's different kind of, uh, interruption for creativity. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I agree. And, um, the, in the lake, the lake looks like an ocean to be honest up there. Yeah. The Although <laughs> I always feel like I should see a dolphin or a whale yes. and of course not, but, uh, it would be nice. <laughs> it is beguiling and it is beautiful and it is sometimes so stormy. It's incredible. Uh, mm -hmm. and it always surprises me. Look at these waves. These are giant. You know? And how one visiting one place, over and over again can be so different from day to yeah. day. Yeah, every day is different, which I think, you know, when we look at Monet's paintings of the haystacks and uh, train stations, and he intentionally painted the same scenes over and over again to kind of relay the differences he observed in the weather mm -hmm. or the atmosphere or the overall experience, there really is a difference day by day mm -hmm. uh, of even the, the humblest bush or the lake or the beach. And uh, it's always interesting to observe. That's beautiful. Always. Yeah, that's beautiful. Wow. Yeah. On that note, what a great, what a great note to end on. And so how do people find you? Uh, you know, they can always find me um, through my business, which is Good Egg Concepts. It's a funny name. It's a, I have a, a page on LinkedIn and Facebook both. So they can mm -hmm. always find me through that or by email or text, which Wonderful. um happy to share. And yeah, we'll make sure we put your contact information in the show thank notes you. as well. Rebecca, I want to thank you so much. It's been, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you. And I'm thank so you. fortunate to have been connected to you. I've enjoyed our conversation immensely. Thank you, Jean. It's been great to be with you today, too. I hope you have a good day. You too. Thank you so much. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Jean. How are you today? I'm wonderful. So good to be here with you. Oh, it's great to have you. So what do you have for us in your rising up segment today, Lynn? Well, I want to talk about something that I call synergy energy. So this is, you know, if we wanted to think about it in terms of nature, <laughs> we might think about it in terms of like the hive mind of a beehive or, or the ants in an anthill where everybody's kind of in sync and doing what they do, right? That's that synergy energy. And, you know, all the wisdom traditions throughout history and throughout the world have some version of this. Biblically, we are familiar with a, a phrase that says where two or more are gathered, there I am, the great I am is in the midst. And it really just means like one plus one is more than two, right? This synergy energy, this this way of being more by coming together. And so we human beings are not bees or ants, but we do have a connection energetically. You know, all of us have experienced walking into a room where there's been an argument and feeling the tension in the air, right? We've all experienced something like that. Or or walking into a room right after a whole bunch of people were laughing hysterically. You can feel that that's a different energy in the room. And so that connection energetically, and, and you know, um, I saw a sign recently that said something like, surround yourself with people who feel like sunshine. Mm. And I really loved that idea that, you know, um, we we could consciously choose that kind of synergy energy, right? Um, and that conscious choice, um, we could consciously choose to be with people who will agree to believe in us and with us for the things that matter to us. So a lot of people would call that a mastermind group. And that term, the mastermind, came from Napoleon Hill's writings and, and you know, he interviewed all those people and, 
they were all men and they were the most successful people in the world at the time. And they all said, I surround myself with smart people. I surround myself with people who will believe with me. And so this idea of synergy energy and this idea of consciously choosing to surround ourselves with people who feel like sunshine, with people who will believe with us and will amplify what we are about by their shared belief, by their shared conscious, intentional synergy energy. It's just something that I think is so powerful. And it's something that I hope the women entrepreneurs who are listening and the and the women who are thinking, where do I have that in my world? I hope that we all consciously step it up a bit, mm. right? Because we can t- we can really bring a feminine energy to this idea of the mastermind, which started out such a male thing, right? By thinking of it in terms of uh, consciously engaging in the synergy energy and amplifying it for each mm-hmm. other. I think that's such a key thing. So uh, I've just been thinking a lot about the synergy energy and I wanted to bring it up. I think we can see it reflected in nature over and over, especially once we start looking for it. And that can be a really awesome thing to experience. So that's my talk for today, Jean. I love that. I love that. Creating the community where one and one is more than two. Yes. And yes, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much as always. I appreciate your Thank time you. and your thoughts. Here. Yes. Thank you so much for listening today. Today's show is sponsored by my Seaside Solutions, my financial services company. As a business owner, it's easy to be pulled in many different directions and often taking care of yourself plummets to the bottom of the list. For me, I find myself outside to reground. My time outdoors helps me manage my day more effectively and be more present for my clients. Through this, Discover Rising Tides was born. At Seaside Solutions, we truly believe that education is the foundation of financial wellness. Our primary focus is to provide guidance that is designed to help you achieve your long-term financial goals and visions. Working with a plan allows space for doing more things that you love, like being outside to make the inside better. If I can help you create or realign your plan, or if you would like to be added to my weekly newsletter, please let me know. This week's topic was five ways to set more achievable goals. Your referral means the big, beautiful world to me. And if I can help, please let me know. And thank you so much for listening and see you next time.